People will sometimes ask me, especially if it's somebody that I'm just getting to know, what my favorite movie is, to which I will inevitably reply, The Lord of the Rings. Yes! But if they continue to ask me to go down my list of favorite movies, eventually somewhere within the top 10, we will arrive at the movie Braveheart. If you aren't familiar with this movie, it tells the story of William Wallace, who, according to the film, is just a simple farmer hoping to live his life in peace and modesty. But because of persistent political and violent oppression by the English king and his nobility, he leads a dramatic rebellion against the English crown, historically known as the Wars of Scottish Independence. And the reason I love this movie so much should be obvious to just about anyone. The cinematography is absorbing, the story is inspiring, the characters portray such heartbreaking depictions of the human condition and the human spirit, and my Scottish heritage tingles with excitement when the cinematic score of James Horner stirs my ancestral spirits. And whatever else you might want to say about Mel Gibson, most honest people have to admit that he's a gifted actor and storyteller. And I don't think I'm alone in my affection or my expression of affection for this film, as it's maintained even through the time that it's been published a steady approval on critical websites like Rotten Tomatoes, as well as having won five Academy Awards, including Best Picture. But for everything I love about this movie, as the title of my video indicates, I have a love-hate relationship with this, this movie. And as time has gone on, and as I've learned more about history, uh, the more I've seen the problems in this movie, uh, which is specifically that it is a powerful instrument of prejudice, which is to say that if you allow it to influence you, you will become more prejudiced by it. And I have to admit, that was the effect that it had on me uh, and my perception of the people and the time that it portrays. And that frankly should bother us because history matters. It matters uh, in how we understand our own ancestry and heritage and how we understand who we are today and how we should either either live in accord with our heritage or in rebellion against it. And this revealed a principle to me as I was reflecting on this topic, especially in anticipation of wanting to talk about it on my channel, which is that it's harder to dig up an overgrown garden than it is to plant a new garden in fresh soil. It's easier to prevent weeds from taking over than it is to get rid of them once they're established. What I mean by this is that it's easier to teach someone something that is true, to educate them, to inform them when they have no false pre-existing prejudices than it is to have to dismantle those false ideas and replace them with good ones. And unfortunately for many of us, if not most of us, movies like Braveheart will be their first or even their only impression of the Middle Ages and the people who lived then. So when attempts are made at explaining what the Middle Ages were like and how they influenced the people that we are today, instead of merely providing that information, we have to fight against false prejudices that have been erected by movies and other cultural phenomena like Braveheart. So what are those prejudices? They are that the high Middle Ages in places like Europe were characterized by political tyranny and oppression, intellectual and technological dimness, violent brutality, and then just to add insult to injury, appallingly bad hygiene for some reason. We then use this ill-begotten perception to compliment ourselves for exemplifying all the things that they were not that we disapprove of. We are just, enlightened, peaceful, and we are very, very clean. And that's a nice thought, isn't it? It's easy to feel good about ourselves when we can identify others who are inferior to us. And this is something that modern people are in the habit of doing, denouncing our ancestors, often out of ignorance, before we pay ourselves the compliment of being superior to them. So why don't we examine a few of these qualities that we associate with the Middle Ages to see if they stand up to historical scrutiny. So why don't we start with political life and supposed political oppression? Because there were outbursts of political injustice throughout history and the Middle Ages were obviously no exception to that. But what's ironic about the values that we hold in our highest regard today as compared to the Middle Ages is that even though they don't show nearly as much regard for some of the things that we do today, they still outperformed us in observing them in some cases. 
So why don't we take freedom, for example. Freedom is the rallying cry of the movie Braveheart. And if you live in a, a liberal democracy like I do, you know that freedom is considered our highest good. And the reason we know that is by asking what it is that people are willing to sacrifice their lives for. When we observe memorials for those who died in modern wars, like the world wars of the 20th century, what do we say that they died for? We don't say that they died for love of others or the common good or for the sake of justice. We say for freedom. They died to preserve our freedoms. But this idea that freedom is our highest good, unconditioned by other goods, is an exclusively modern philosophical idea proposed by modern philosophers like Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, and which would have been extremely foreign to the mind of a medieval person. And for all of the unbearable oppression we hear about the medieval peasant, did you know that they actually enjoyed more vacation time than the average working class person today? In fact, by the 14th century, it wasn't uncommon for British peasants to enjoy half, half the year off. <laughs> And the reason for this was because of the advocacy of the church, as well as other layers of society such as guilds, which shaped the political and economic interests of society. That highly integrated system of political organization was designed to provide and protect for the dignity of every human person, regardless of their state. It meant for the average person, whoever it was that they were accountable in the chain of political hierarchy, it was somebody who was local to them and not nearly as powerful and resource rich as some of the structures that are common today. For example, if today a huge powerful national organization like let's say the IRS wanted to make your life miserable and single you out, they can, and there's nobody who will stand in their way to defend you. Today, as an ordinary citizen, there's nothing between you and I and the all-powerful state. But in the Middle Ages, the king couldn't just make demands on the ordinary citizen. He would first have to go through the local lord, the landowner, the sheriff, the guild, the church, and a highly integrated extended community and family life that would have surrounded and insulated you. And yes, all of that structure and hierarchy could be perceived as a limit on your freedoms, but the people of that time were more concerned with shared community, shared culture, safety, stability, virtue, and eternal life. Freedom the way that we think about it today would have been perceived as oppressive and probably dangerous in their minds. What about their violent brutality? Because of course the Middle Ages are synonymous with violence, right? Even the other day I was watching YouTube and it recommended a video from a channel I'd never heard of before, which was all about medieval life. And since that's something I'm interested in, I watched one of their videos. The first one, which was all about the Iron Maiden, not to be confused with Great Britain's greatest musical export of the 20th century. The Iron Maiden, as the video explains, was a torture device that could only have been conceived by the warped psyche of the medieval mind. It was shaped like a sarcophagus that the victims would be placed in, and it was lined with spikes that were designed and configured in such a way so as not to puncture vital organs right away in order to prolong suffering before death. The video goes on to explain that it was heavily employed by Torquemada and the Spanish Inquisition, which all sounds great, but there's just one tiny problem with this claim, which is that none of it is true. None of it. The Iron Maiden was a modern fabrication told, I think, I presume, to scare us into thinking all kinds of things about the Middle Ages, which are not true, in order to establish prejudice in us. It never existed, and it was never used by the Spanish Inquisition. Fine, even if we grant that, though, it's still undeniable that the Middle Ages were obsessed with war and violence, right? Well, after the fall of the Roman Empire, it's true that in that vacuum of power, there did become a warrior class of nobility who took over and became dominant in Europe. And because they were a warrior class, their business was war, which they would often direct at their neighbors, whose business also was warfare. But in an effort to curb that violence, the church not being able to fight itself, used the means that she had at her disposal, specifically her her moral authority, wit, 
and rhetoric to influence the military class to adopt a certain ethical code that would limit their warring instincts. They were inspired by legends and stories of King Arthur and his knights, stories that were composed by Catholic clergy, so that instead of using their talent for warfare to seize land and wealth, they were to direct that energy towards protecting the innocent and the helpless according to the teachings of Christianity. And these codes eventually became known as the chivalric codes. It extended to codes of honor about how warfare itself was to be conducted if it was deemed necessary. It was to be done in an honorable way, facing your adversary openly on equal footing in the hopes of minimizing the carnage. And these codes of minimizing warfare and the damage that could be caused by warfare were unfamiliar to non-Christian civilizations. I remember once reading an account by a Native American chief and warrior who, after witnessing the way that Europeans would fight against each other for the first time, convinced themselves that Native Americans, to whatever degree they would have to fight against them, would prevail against them. He couldn't understand why they would line up on a field and face each other openly in daylight because they were used to tactics like raiding military encampments under the cover of darkness and guerrilla warfare, he couldn't understand why they would employ tactics designed to minimize the damage to their enemy, because after all, that's what war is all about. And the reason that all changed was because of Napoleon and the French Revolution. In the name of equality and freedom, Napoleon stripped away all of those societal structures of hierarchy and integration that insulated the average citizen from an all-powerful despotic ruler like himself. Once all of those structures were removed, Napoleon could do something that was contrary to medieval notions and Christian notions of warfare. He could enlist the working class as soldiers. Because back in the Middle Ages, there were the three estates, there were the three classes of people. There was the clergy, there was the nobility, and there was the working class. And it was the nobility, the warrior class, who were tasked with the responsibility for fighting. And it was extremely uncommon and uncharacteristic of that political organization for them to employ the working class or the clergy in the cause of warfare. But because of Napoleon's policy of total warfare, he was able to enlist all of the working class, every fighting age male in all of France to build his grand army that all the other European powers were helpless to defend against. And since he was already disregarding Christian notions of honor in warfare, he could also employ certain kinds of tactics like not meeting his adversaries openly on the field and employing surprise attacks. Eventually, the other European powers, in order to defeat him, had to employ those same tactics, which opened a Pandora's box of war warfare that would eventually lead to the carnage of the 20th century's world wars. This is also what gave us the habit of modern military leaders or nation state leaders declaring war and then sending other people to do the fighting for them. In the Middle Ages, if you decided to go to war with somebody, you had to fight it yourself. That's why kings, princes, and nobility often died or were captured in war because they were charging in with the vanguard. The fact that you would have to fight yourself if you declared war on a rival was one more measure of honor that put restraints on leaders from recklessly conducting warfare in the Middle Ages. Today, if leaders like George Bush or Vladimir Putin are tempted by war, the temptation is all the more seductive with the confident knowledge that they will never come in harm's way if they decide to proceed. The more I've had the opportunity to learn about the Middle Ages, the more I am impressed by their nobility, their courage, their virtue, and their wisdom, and the more angered I am by my own prejudices, which have taken years to unravel as a result of cultural influences like Hollywood cinema. And as I grow in my appreciation for that time period, I've been more willing to admit the faults of our own time and recognize that if we weren't so intolerant of our ancestors, we might find some solutions to the problems that persist today, and not only persist, but in some cases are getting quite a bit worse because we insist on coming up with our own novel, untested solutions, instead of humbly admitting that the traditions we've rejected uh, might be worth re-exploring. And movies like Braveheart are a big reason for our stubborn pride in refusing to do just that. So while I can enjoy it for its filmmaking, storytelling, and acting, I can't help but resent its slanderous treatment of history and its use of medieval people as a mouthpiece for modern, and I would add and argue, failed ideologies. Hey, thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you are able to support the work I'm doing, there are a couple of ways you can do that. By donating through my website or by joining my online community, The Reinforcements. Both can be done by visiting brianholdsworth.ca. The .ca because that's how we internet in Canada. 
And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. And again, thanks for watching.